I met Margaret when I was, uh, I became her new pastor. And so uh, I went and visited all the church folks, um, except Margaret was different, unlike the others. Margaret never came to church. She didn't come to church because Margaret was homebound. She was in a wheelchair, and her home was Morningside Senior Care Center. So as I went to get to know Margaret and I visited with her, um, I realized something. I realized that, uh, you know, Margaret lives, she's homebound in this place. She doesn't do laundry for her kids anymore. She doesn't make her favorite uh, vegetable soup recipe for her husband anymore. She's a widow. She no longer works as a patient scheduler at the dentist office where she worked for 39 years. It's a prison. At least that's how Margaret described it to me. Pastor, I'm just, I'm just wasting time here. Why, God, why doesn't God just take me to heaven? You know, and I couldn't help but notice when I was there that, uh, you know, she did get three really good meals a day prepared by a professional chef. And that she was making plenty of new friends. And that she had professional caregivers who would come and they, they would do the laundry for her and they would clean the kitchen for her. I mean, ladies, is that the bomb or what? And yet she still asked the question, Pastor, why am I here? You know, Margaret's not alone in that. Uh, a young mom with a dream husband and perfect neighbors and a Tesla parked in the garage can ask, why am I here? So can a college freshman. So can a military veteran who retires at the age of 32 with a lifelong disability. So can anyone who gets out of bed every morning. Why am I here? So why are you here? Why do you live where you live? Why do you work where you work? Why did you come here this morning? Why do you steer your Toyota Camry on the streets uh, to and from work every day or t taking the kids to and from swimming practice? I mean, why? Why are you here? I think that's actually a very great question, a very clarifying question. And whether it's wondering why you drive to work where you do, or wondering why you spend late, late nights on the weekend with the friends that you do, or wondering why you signed up for hot yoga, or wondering why you're in this relationship, we ask, why am I here? It is such, I, I like the question because it can be very clarifying if you're willing to accept the answer that is not your own. And by that I mean God has an answer to that question. God's Word has an answer to that question. So that question can go one of two ways as far as where it takes you. All right? That, that question, why am I here, will take you one direction if it's curious faith. But that question will take you in an entirely different direction if it's constant complaint. Let me give you an example of constant complaint. Um, ah, man, all the other people on my team, they're just a bunch of idiots. I mean, how, how, how can I put up with these people? I mean, why am I here? All right, you hear it? Constant complaint. <clears throat> Looking in the mirror in the morning, God, I, I, why did you make me this way? Why did you give me this body? I don't want to be the person that you made me to be. I mean, that's... Why am I here? Or pounding your hands on the steering wheel, uh, <laughs> stuck in rush hour traffic as, as you're headed to work. Ah, why am I here? And, and you're the one that made the choice to work and live 90 minutes apart from each other, and it's your commute, and you're trying to blame other people. Why am I here? You know, there, there's people in the Bible who ask that question, why am I here? We have some really good examples of, of how we can learn from them, both asking the question as, as constant complaint, and then also some other people in the Bible asking it as curious faith. And it's great to contrast the two for our learning. So I'm going to give you a couple examples right now. So um, in the Bible, 
people who asked, why am I here? And it was constant complaint. One of the biggest examples I can think of is the Israelites, with God's people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, when he had rescued them from Egypt, from slavery in Egypt, right? And he sent them on their long journey to the promised land. And no sooner had they left Egypt. I mean, there was very soon than they were complaining God, this is too hard. We don't, we don't have the, the leeks and onions that we ate in Egypt. Well, we'd rather be slaves in Egypt than free people traveling to a promised land. Constant complaint. Job, why, God, why? Why was I born? Job, is, Job repented in the end, but he is not the righteous saint through his whole story that sometimes people think he was. Constant com- God, why? all over in the book of Job. I think of King Saul. He was so full of himself that there was no room for God in his heart. All those people and any of us, when we want to ask that question of of God, why am I here? And we ask it in an accusatory way or even ask it of others in an accusatory way and it's it's constant complaint. We're just on our own mission then. And we're not on God's mission. It, it ended up bad for, for all those people in the Bible I just mentioned who are constantly complaining about God. It, it does not go well. But there are people in the Bible who weren't complaining with that question, but really curiously seeking in faith and asking, God, why am I here? I think of Jacob when he was wrestling with God. This is in the book of Genesis, first book of the Bible in the Old Testament, and Jacob is that God actually appears as a man, and Jacob is wrestling with him, and it's just this great example as Jacob is wondering, you know, why? Why, why is this happening? Why am I going where, where I'm going? Why am I here? And it's just a great example of, of the balanced tension of fighting and also letting go in faith. And Jacob asked, why am I here? And he, he, he was looking to God for the answer. Think of Joseph, Jacob's son, Joseph. And he was betrayed by his brothers. Cruel stuff. He was framed by his boss. Big injustice. And he was put in prison. Why, God? Why am I here? But he asked that looking for God's amazing answer. He ended up being uh, number two in power in Egypt. And, uh, and, and things turned out well when he was asking God that question and letting God answer. I think of Mary, Jesus' mother Mary. She's a, she's a simple young lady from a little village of Nazareth, and she's engaged to be married to Joseph, and all of a sudden God tells her, uh, hey, you know what, I'm going to make you pregnant. And... Young girls who were engaged to be married were not supposed to be pregnant yet. What? God, why? And then she had to be wondering on that trip after she was nine months pregnant and ready to give birth in Nazareth when Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the entire Roman world should be taxed and what had to happen? Mary and Joseph had to go right from Nazareth up to Bethlehem, 75 miles. And I'd be asking the question if I were Mary, God, why am I here headed to Bethlehem when I could be at home? Why am I here? I want to read you um, some of Mary's words that really sum up well her asking that question, why am I here, out of curious faith. Okay, so uh, God God had sent his angel to tell Mary, hey, guess what? You're you're pregnant. It's going to change your life. Uh, people won't know that it's the Holy Spirit. They're going to think that you and Joseph or you and some other guy had something going on before you're married. I'm sorry about that, but that's the way it is. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm, God is like, I'm laying this on you. The Bible says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words, the angel's words. She was troubled. Right? You ever get troubled with what God's doing in your life? Okay, she was troubled and wondered what kind of greeting this might be, the angel's greeting. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Mary Mary got more curious. Her faith reached further. How will this be? Right? 
Why? What's going on, God? Why am I here listening to this angel telling me I'm getting pregnant? Why, why am I here? How can this be? That can be a question of constant complaint. That can be a question of curious faith. Mary is a curious faith. And that's okay. It's okay to be curious about what God's doing in your, in your life. It's okay to be curious. And then the angel answered her and said, this is the power of God. This is the promise of God. This is God's purpose for you. And her response was, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Hmm. When you ask God, why am I here? Are you willing to accept God's answer? And his answer is awesome. His answer will God's word, God's purpose, God's power is so much bigger than your little ideas compared to God, your little ideas about what's happening and what should be happening. So, so I sat down with Margaret, who asked, why am I here? Why doesn't God just take me to heaven? Have you ever had an elderly person ask you that before? Maybe I think it's pretty common for elderly folks to wonder, especially um, seniors um, with just a wonderful faith that just says, I just, I want to be in heaven with my Savior. That really would be nice right now. And why, why am I still here? Well, there's an answer to that, and here it is. So I sat and I grabbed Margaret's trembling hand, and I looked into her eyes, starting to fill with tears. I said, Margaret, you're here because God is here. And because he has a reason for you to be here with him. Not in heaven with him, at least right now, but here. So, Margaret, the, the caregivers who come in and take care of you, there are caregivers who come and take care of you, and they need Jesus. And I bet there's some of them who don't know Jesus. And so as they watch you, your, your arthritic hands, trying to get around in a wheelchair, as they watch you suffer, as, as they watch you live alone without your husband anymore, as they watch you long for your grandchildren to visit, but they don't, and they see how you respond, how you react, how you handle adversity, you, Margaret, can show them the peace of Jesus. And Margaret, your grandchildren who come to visit you, you know, when they do God has you here, so you can tell them, can you color me a picture of, of Jesus' resurrection? Can you color me a picture of the cross? Can, can I teach you to pray? And when they hug you and they leave, and you can say to them, Jesus loves you. Margaret, that's why you're here. I said, Margaret, God's kingdom is here. God is here. He's working in you and through you. So how about for you? Like in your world, your life, you're not homebound because you're here. But we all have our Margaret moments in life, and we wonder, what's God up to? Why, why am I here? Does it help what I explained to Margaret about God is here, and God's kingdom is here. So, so I have this question, and, uh, and I want it to help clarify where we're going as far as the why. And the question is this, um, where is the kingdom of God? Where is the kingdom of God? 7.4 out of 10 people, if I stopped on the street and asked them that question, would say the kingdom of God is in heaven. And that's not wrong, but it's not right. Because that's not the only place where the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is wherever God is operating, wherever he's doing his work. And where is that? Everywhere. That God's kingdom is everywhere. But where, where we find God at work then, and, and God's work, God's kingdom work is, I want every sinner saved. That's his, that's his work. And he goes to work with that through the gospel, the power of the gospel, that God's word proclaimed, the sacraments of, of holy communion and baptism. And that ends up being what Jesus wants too. God the Father wants Jesus in more people's lives, and Jesus says, that's my mission. So where the, where the kingdom of God is, there is the mission of Jesus. It's happening. It's there. And now, 
I'm going to show you this, these words of Jesus because um, the context of it is good and, and what Jesus is instructing us is good because it helps us think about the why, the purpose of, of what life is about while we're here. And Jesus' work is to get more people to believe in him. You have to understand, you can't save anyone or yourself from your sins. Only Jesus can do that. And you can't bring someone to faith. Only Jesus can do that. And so Jesus doesn't want you to do his work for him. He wants you to do his work with him. So that's why before, even before his disciples were, were heading out to do a bunch of teaching and preaching and, and even healing, even before that, Jesus said these words in Mark chapter 1. The, the time has come, Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. You see, he's telling his disciples, the kingdom of God, it's already here. It has, it has come. And it's working. It's near. So even before I got to the nursing home to talk to Margaret, the senior care center, even before you get to work to, to hopefully invite your friend to church this coming Sunday. Even before you take the kids to swim, Jesus is already there. Jesus is already doing, doing his work. Even before that, that's what he told his disciples. The kingdom of God is already active. Um, Jesus is active in the, on the scene. He's active in circumstances. And then he, what do you say to us? He says, repent. Repent means turn. Turn the other direction. Repent. So we turn from why am I here complaining to why am I here curiosity and faith. We repent, and then we believe the good news. That's the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the gospel. That gospel is for everybody, including everyone out there and everyone in the world. But we have to understand something about the world, about our society and culture, if we're going to connect with them, with, with the gospel. And so that's this. Over the last few decades, and especially over the last few years, the culture, the religious culture of society has shifted. It's changed. Okay, so back in Leave it to Beaver days, or even the 70s, 80s, uh, generally speaking, people thought that church was a good, even if they don't, you didn't go to church, they thought that church was good for society. It was, it was good for the community. It's, it's a good, safe place. Okay? Church, church is all right. And they thought that pastors are, you know, de decent human beings who, who help. And, and they thought the, the Bible generally is a good guide for morals. I mean, I'm talking about culture here, not church, just people in, in general society. Bible's good. And Jesus, yeah, nice guy. I, respect for Jesus, respect for the Bible. That was 40, 50 years ago. That's not today. Not in our culture today. Our culture today disrespects Jesus, disagrees with the Bible, and is disavowed from and disappointed with the church. That I'm just that's culture. It's not that's not you and that's not me, but that's that's what culture thinks. So we have to understand that there's been a shift from society being a church culture, like acceptable and the church is a positive thing a church culture, to a legitimate mission field. When we look at what people in our society, our community, your neighbors, my neighbors, what they generally think about the church and the Bible and Jesus. It's not good. That's why it's a mission field. What an opportunity. It's like the, uh, like the shoe salesman whose manager sent him to primitive villages. And he got to, yes, the shoe salesman got to these primitive villages and he called his Manager back, he says, wait a minute, why, why did he send me here? Nobody here wears shoes. And his manager said, congratulations, you're just going to break the sales records. No competition. Not a problem, it's an opportunity. So that's why you see this sign, the sandwich board, as you leave church every Sunday outside of our front doors. Right? It says, you are now entering Jesus mission field. Who's mission field? Who's there? Who's ahead of you? Who's already on the scene? Jesus is, is out, not just in here, but he's out there where you are, where you go, and where you work, and where you play, and where you run your errands, and where, you're, where you buy your groceries. Jesus is there working in circumstances and working in people's lives, and he's waiting for you to show up on the scene 
to join him in his mission and to work there too. Uh, it, it, it's important for us as a church and a school to recognize that the culture has changed. And not just to open our doors on Sunday and say, well, people are going to come. Because generally speaking, people think the church is a good place. That's not true. So we need to go out there individually, personally, and we need to join Jesus on his mission um, for those people. Um, so let's look around, right? Let's, let's, let's recognize where Jesus is at work in people's lives and let's respond to it. And let's do it with excitement and vigor, not being confused, not being scared, not telling the world they're going to hell in a handbasket and just, just wiping it out of our minds. Um, mm -mm. Um, Greg Finke, in his book, Joining Jesus on His Mission, um, says this. He said it well. Um, I'm going to read what he writes there. He says, Jesus isn't struggling, and he knows exactly what to do next. So while some of our churchy presumptions and programs may be in trouble because of this culture thing, his church, Jesus' church, is not. Jesus is moving out on his mission to redeem and restore all people to his Father's kingdom, and he invites us to join him. So Jesus, right now, is at work in your neighbor's mind who, who lost their job and they're looking for hope. Jesus is on that scene. Jesus is on the scene of uh, a family member who's who experienced a loss uh, and they're lonely. Jesus is there, just like Jesus was in Margaret's little room in Morningside Senior Care Center before I got there, working so that we could have that conversation. So as much as you trust Jesus for your salvation, he died and he rose, you trust him for your salvation. Trust him for others' salvation too. Trust him that, that, that he is on the scene ahead of you and that you are going to join him on his mission. And when you do, you are going to see that he is at work, not just in your lives, but in other lives too. Amen.